Yeah, so hi, I'm, uh, my name is Mark. I'm a machine learning researcher at Prado.io. Um, I'm really interested in building probabilistic models that uh, can make predictions about the world while also understanding their uncertainty. Um, and I'm particularly interested in this because I want to make data efficient, model based reinforcement learning algorithms. Uh, essentially, a lot of my research, in particular, builds around Gaussian processes, which I believe can be like a, a, a building block for the Bayesian neural networks of the future. So today, I'd really like to uh, kind of give you a brief overview and an intro. Half an hour is nowhere near enough to kind of delve into Gaussian processes in depth. So I just want to give you a kind of a feel for the different, um, the different kind of approach towards modeling that Gaussian process uh, uses, and I also want to give you um, an overview of the benefits of Gaussian processes. Uh, I'll also talk a bit about software, so we, uh, uh, we at Prouder uh, develop a, an open source software project called GPFlow, which is, uh, uh, which is based on TensorFlow and interfaces with TensorFlow nicely. Um, so if you're interested in uh, putting into practice what you hear today, then uh, there's software right there that you can use online. Right, so um, I'll start off with uh, an introduction to Gaussian processes. So because, the, because this is the, uh, the TensorFlow meetup, I'm going to start where uh, I think that everybody is familiar with, and that's neural networks. <laughs> so um, super simple, right? Like, uh, what is a neural network? Well. In statistical, ter in kind of the statistical literature, people would kind of call a neural network a basis function model. What does that mean? Well, essentially, it means that we create complicated functions from simple building blocks that we see on the left called basis functions, and we essentially uh, adjust or we sum together the basis functions with different weights in order to create complicated functions. So, on the right-hand side, we see the components of the of the thick red function. And each one of those components is a, is a scaled basis function. And then we sum them all together, and we get our overall function, f. So um, that's a neural network. And um, actually, a Gaussian process is nothing else than a different representation of a neural network that gives us some really nice uh, properties, which I'll have to convince you of. So um, the first thing that we try to address with Gaussian processes, or the first thing that people try to do with neural networks is say, Try to adjust these weights in order to get the function to go through the data so that it so that it generalizes, right? Uh, with Gaussian processes, we're trying to take a Bayesian approach, hence why I think they can be useful in Bayesian learning. Uh, and instead of finding a point estimate for this W, we instead try to find a distribution over Ws. So what does this mean? And what's 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 kind of the idea behind Bayesian uh, Bayesian neural networks? Well, the idea is essentially that. Um, if you have a limited amount of data, then that doesn't tell you enough about your parameters to pin them down uh, exactly right, which is why we want to measure our uncertainty back then. The Bayesian procedure essentially starts off with um, expressing our uncertainty that we have when we haven't seen any data, and we call this a prior. So what I've visualized on the left-hand side here is essentially the basis function model of the neural network from the previous slide, but I've put a distribution over the weights. And then I've drawn a few uh, different weights from this distribution, and because every single weight gives us a function, we get a distribution over functions there. The blue shaded region is the, uh, the, the, the error bars, essentially, the, uh, the uncertainty. Now, um, in order to learn the weights, uh, instead of finding a single weight, what we try to do is we try to find the distribution that is both consistent with our prior knowledge, so our prior uncertainty, and consistent with the extra data that we, uh, that we observe. Uh, and that's what you see on the, on the right hand side. So instead of our trained parameter, we have a whole distribution of our parameters. And this kind of gives us uh, nice uncertainty properties. So you kind of see that near the data, the basis functions have been uh, pinned down, and we have little uncertainty. But in the middle, where we don't have any data, there is um, uh, some uncertainty left because we don't exactly know what the basis functions in that location are doing. Right, so um, long story short, uh, at the bottom I've got Bayes' rule, which is essentially the mathematical rule that we use to uh, update our weights or update the distribution of our weights. So we measure uncertainty by uh, using probability distributions over the weights. Uh, learning essentially reduces this uncertainty. Uh, we, we keep uncertainty in regions where we don't have any data. 
and beta rule uh, updates the weights. So the funny thing is, is that I keep talking about these functions that we try to learn. And that's essentially what we try to do when we try to do deep learning, right? We don't really care about the weights. The only thing we care about is the function relationship between the input and the output that we're trying to predict. So the only thing that Gaussian processes do, and the way that they're different to neural networks, is that they don't represent weights. They represent distributions over functions directly. They cut out the middleman. So um, here I've got a, a kind of a, a representation of one particular Gaussian process and all the, and all the different functions that we, uh, that we can draw from them. And on the right, I've kind of shown you the equivalent posterior uh, for the same data set as on the previous slide. Now, the first immediate advantage that this gives you is that you don't, you're not kind of constrained by this representation of functions in terms of weights anymore. So in many Gaussian processes, we can actually use an infinite amount of weights where we don't have to represent them because we want to work with functions directly. And you can kind of see the advantage of this immediately in this example, because previously, because we only had basis functions near the center of the input domain, we couldn't actually represent that we were uncertain about what was happening far away from the data. So we see that over here, the, the error bars are actually way overconfident. You know? And this, this actually happens in deep learning as well, where if you, uh, you're asked to extrapolate, you ask your model to extrapolate, it becomes overconfident. Gaussian process, on the other hand, because they can use an infinite amount of basis functions that we essentially put everywhere along the input domain, can actually represent this uncertainty even when you're far away from the data. And so you get these nice big error bars with lots of uncertainty uh, about what's going on. So I, I want to give a, a, a kind of a brief hand wavy overview of what this means mathematically. So I kind of talk about an infinite number of weights, and hopefully that image kind of shows you that at least having a lot of a lot of basis functions and a lot of weights is a good thing, but we can't actually work with an infinite number of weights. So what do we do instead? Well, instead what we do is we represent functions in terms of what they do at particular points. And uh, so instead of putting a distribution over the weights, we put a distribution over those function values directly. And then we've got this thing called the covariance, which determines the properties of our functions uh, and how one function value in one position relates to a function value in another position. So I'll give you a lot of, a lot of images in this, uh, in this talk, so hopefully you can get a bit of an intuition for, for how this all works. Um, right, so that's our Gaussian process. Right, so I spoke about the advantage of uh, uncertainty being uh, a big advantage of Gaussian processes, and this is the most well known. The actual second advantage of Gaussian processes is that it actually gives us a, a kind of principled method for automatically adjusting the assumptions we make in our model. So you make loads of assumptions in deep learning models, right? So you make assumptions about the uh, number of layers, you make assumptions about what kind of activation function you use, um, you make uh, assumptions about how many neurons you need in every single layer, and all these essentially influence uh, how the model generalizes, right? Like a fully connected network makes a very different generalization to a um, to a, a, a convolutional network, and your activation function that you use will also make it very different. Uh, will also influence the um, extrapolation that you make. And there's actually this really nice mathematical uh, connection between understanding your uncertainty and being able to know which assumptions in your model are good uh, for predicting well in the future. Um, and essentially, all I really want to say about it is that if you can compute um, what's called the marginal likelihood rather than the usual likelihood that you choose your, uh, to train your uh, neural network with. Then if you optimize that, you actually can choose your uh, model structure um, automatically. And the nice thing about Gaussian processes is that we can get good approximations for this marginal likelihood, and that's really hard for uh, neural networks. And the reason why we can get good approximations for our marginal likelihood is because we can approximate our uncertainty really well. So that's the second, um, uh, the second advantage of Gaussian processes. So in order to convince you that this is um, an important thing to do, I just wanted to give you a few, different a few different examples of different assumptions that you can make in your model. So here I've uh, got three different pictures for uh, different distributions over functions, which uh, ex essentially generalize in different ways, right? So we can kind of assume something about our functional relationship between our inputs and our outputs, 
and we can assume that it's super smooth, for example, like in the middle uh, uh, picture, or we can uh, believe that it's a really rough uh, uh, relationship, so people often use these kind of models for stock markets, or you can assume that it's, that it's exactly periodic. Right? And obviously, if you make these different kinds of assumptions, it'll, it'll generalize in a different way. So Gaussian processes give you two things. They give you a way to express this uh, interesting structure, and they also give you a method for choosing which is the right structure given your data set. Um, so just to give a, a, a little example of this, here I've got a data set that I replicated three different times, and um, I've got three different priors of a Gaussian process that all depend on the parameter that essentially tells you how wiggly it is, you know? And we kind of need to find the right wiggliness in order to uh, be able to predict our, uh, our target really well. So we kind of see that on the left, it's, we, we use very wiggly functions, and um, uh, we, we kind of see that the, the green function, which is the true function, uh, is, is not, I mean, at least it's contained within the error bars of our prediction, but our prediction is actually way off in the middle, right? Then on the right-hand side, where we say that our functions can't be wiggly at all, um, we, we kind of draw a line straight through all the data, and we don't really fit the, um, yeah, the kind of subtle periodicity in the, in the model very well. And in the, in the middle, we've kind of got the Goldilocks zone, where we fit the, um, uh, the wiggliness exactly right, and we actually see a very good fit between uh, the prediction and the true and the true function that generated the data. So, yeah, I just want to emphasize again the usefulness of the marginal likelihood. So, if you did this with a neural network, how would you approach this problem? Well, the way that you would do this is you'd essentially train three different models with three different regularization parameters or three different, um, uh, three different activation functions, and then you'd hold out your validation set and see how well your model does in your validation set, right? This is cumbersome because essentially you need to uh, train a model three times just to find this one parameter. A Gaussian process gives you this marginal likelihood, which is at the bottom, which you can optimize directly. So if you just train your, your Gaussian process on this data set, it will automatically tell you that is the right wickedness. So this is a very, very simple and kind of boring uh, example of, uh, uh, of model, uh, of kind of model properties that you want to select, but I'll give some more exciting examples later. But uh, I, hope it's, I hope you'd agree with me that the ability to just be able to train and to not actually think about it, just uh, in, in, in a single gradient descent uh, loop, is, is quite a nice, desirable property to have. So, yeah, that's the whistle-stop tour, the whistle-stop intro uh, to Gaussian processes. Uh, long story short, uh, it's got better uncertainty estimates than uh, neural networks with finite numbers of uh, basis functions. It's robust to overfitting. Um, and it can automatically train your regularization and uh, parameters and model, model properties. Um, I'll leave the disadvantages to the end. <laughs> um, right. So, how do we train Gaussian processes? Essentially, the, the point that I'm trying to make in this particular section is that training Gaussian processes isn't actually that different from training a neural network. It's just that you represent a distribution over functions instead of just a single parameter of weights. So, I won't go into the details again, but um, the way that we do this is variational inference. So, I think everybody in deep learning should hear about variational inference because it's, the, uh, it's essentially the cornerstone of very popular methods like uh, GANs. And essentially, it's, it's a method for finding your uh, uncertainty about certain parameters through optimization. And the way that you essentially do this is by starting with your prior distribution again, so that's your uncertainty before you see any data, and then you also represent a distribution over what you think your solution is, including all your uncertainty. That's what we call our Q distribution here. And then what we want to maximize is the probability of seeing our actual data, given our, uh, our, our function that we learned, which is f, average over our uh, Q distribution, which is this uh, distribution that represents our uncertainty, and then we regularize to make our uh, uncertainty to be large, to be close to the, uh, the prior, so that we don't overfit and become too confident too quickly. Uh, that's the procedure that we pull out. Now, essentially, the nice thing about this uh, uh, method is that it's actually very, very similar to the objective, objective function that we use in neural networks. Right? It's just a loss, which is your log p, um, over 
in this case, a distribution over uh, parameters rather than a, or a distribution over functions rather than a single parameter. And we've got some regularization things that make, stop us from overfitting to our data. So algorithmically, it's similar and conceptually it's similar as well. But we get some extra benefits. Um, so just to give a bit of a, a kind of feel for um, what we can adjust in these Q distributions and how we um, and how we how we essentially represent distributions over functions. Here I kind of show um, one or three different parameters that we can move around to move around this distribution over functions, right? And we do this, we parameterize it in this way instead of using parameters. So instead of using weights, I mean. So essentially here what we see, oh, here we see what happens to our distribution over functions if we move around uh, the kind of input locations where we kind of pin down what our, what our distribution is doing. So this is one particular parameter that we, that we can use. Alternatively, we can also um, move around like the, the height or the, the location of where we pin down our, our particular distribution. And we can also change our uncertainty. Oh. Which is what we do here. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to move these kind of properties of our distribution over functions around such that it fits the data. And we've got a nice animation of that here. So let's just wait until it resets. So here it starts off not fitting the data at all, and then we kind of move around these properties of this distribution over functions, see we've got lots of different functions that go through our, um, our, our data until it actually fits. Right about now, it should notice that actually so the data point there, and whoop, it kind of tightens around that distribution here. So you can see it's nice and uncertain in this kind of regime. It's uncertain here where it doesn't have any data, but it's, it makes very clean type predictions around our data points there. Just a quick visualization of what kind of solutions uh, we get from Gaussian process and how this training, training works. Um, right, so here I kind of want to give a, an, an actual little case study about how this, uh, about how we can build interesting Gaussian process models and how this marginal likelihood actually can be used to test like how good the predictions are. So um, the data set that uh, I want to kind of demonstrate this on is what's called the Mamaloa data set. So it's, um, it's essentially a measurement of the carbon dioxide level in the atmosphere uh, at the top of Mamaloa, which is a volcano in Hawaii. And the task that we're trying to solve here is we want to predict uh, what, the, um, what the future carbon dioxide level are going to be. Now, um, there are a few things that I want to highlight in the next few slides. Firstly, I, kind of, I want to highlight like, how important your prior assumptions are about your, um, about your data. Uh, sorry, your prior assumptions in your model are. So in this particular example, I've essentially only assumed that the functions need to be smooth, right? So what we see here is that it actually fits our training data really well, but it actually doesn't make a good extrapolation at all. So, and, and it's, it kind of makes sense that this is going to happen, because if we look at the distribution of, of functions here, which is kind of our distribution of functions uh, before we see any data, nothing really allows like any linear trends or anything like that. Okay? So, it's not weird that this model doesn't, doesn't extrapolate very well. We can use the Gaussian process to express more complicated uh, uh, extrapolation, uh, extrapolation properties which we do in this particular case, and then suddenly, so if you allow linear trends, we suddenly see that it actually does pick up on both the uh, interpolation of, uh, of like wiggles and the linear trend, and suddenly predates a lot more sensibly. However, uh, one thing that it still doesn't pick up on is this, um, is this uh, periodic trend, right? So, as you saw earlier, we can also have Gaussian processes that are constrained to have periodic, uh, uh, the periodic behavior, and if we kind of add that kind of a component into the Gaussian process, it can get pretty much everything right and give a really nice periodic uh, extrapolation of the data set that we saw. Now, essentially I've given you three different solutions, but how do we know which one to pick, right? And 
Essentially, um, I've also plotted the marginal likelihoods for every single one of these models. And you can kind of see that the marginal likelihood for the periodic model is way higher than for any of the other models. So what Gaussian process allow you to do is kind of put all these recipes into a big cauldron and let the marginal likelihood pick automatically which combination it needs to choose. So it's super automatic. And if you kind of see the final predictions with some, some testing data, you see that it gets both the uh, predictive mean and the uncertainty bars uh, exactly right. So all this uh, is done using our open source uh, library, uh, which is built on TensorFlow. Um, here we've got a little example of how it interoperates with TensorFlow. So you can kind of create models, and uh, it allows you to um, it allows you to interoperate with other bits of TensorFlow. So in this particular example, we show how you can put a, a Gaussian process on top of a neural network to give it some better understanding of its own uncertainty. So here we've essentially said, uh, take our data set X, pass it through a few dense and dropout, uh, dropout layers, and then pass that to some internal gas, uh, some internal functions that can gas pro process properties. And this model you can now train using the standard uh, TensorFlow optimizers, and it'll give you essentially better uncertainties to your to your network. So if you're interested in this, you can uh, you can you can check it out online. It's, it's on GitHub if you search for GP flow. Right, so what's next with Gaussian processes? Um, one of the reasons why I'm doing research in, into this area is because I think that um, they've got the potential to be uh, a layer in deep, uh, in kind of deep models of the future. And there'll be layers that give you all kinds of benefits like uncertainty and automatic tuning of all kinds of free parameters. Uh, so one particular uh, paper that we published recently was uh, showed you how to automatically tune your data augmentation algorithm. So data augmentation is, is something that people often apply to classify their, their images better. And the way that it works is that you take your data set and kind of enlarge it by performing all kinds of small transformations on your image, right? You might rotate them a little bit, you might scale them a little bit, you might zoom a little bit. And the goal is that you want to make your uh, neural network less sensitive to these kind of changes. But this is a super laborious process, right? You need a human to kind of sit there and say, well, how much of this kind of rotation do I need to add? And they need to train a model and uh, then see whether I make it adding more rotation and makes your performance worse or better. You know, it's, 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 it's this very laborious human in the loop process. Whereas the marginal likelihood just allows you to train it in, in one go. And this is kind of the result that we got for, for MNIST. So it kind of showed you that for MNIST uh, transformations like small skews, small rotations, uh, would, would help you improve your classification performance. So the big research question for me is like, can we use these methods to also automatically learn how many layers do we need to use? When do we need to use skip connections? Does it need to be convolutional or not? What activation function do we use? It would be great if we can just like put these all into like a single model and then let the model optimize and automatically figure out what the, uh, uh, what the optimal combination should be. We're working on uh, getting this into um, kind of larger scale applications as well. So we're actually in touch with the TensorFlow probability uh, guys that, we, uh, that was mentioned earlier. Uh, and we had a paper at a NeurIPS workshop last year that, that showed how Gaussian processes can fit into a Keras-like um, a Keras -like software framework that allows for both Bayesian neural networks and Gaussian processes to be switched in and out at will. So this is an example of that kind of, um, yeah, it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit of a, uh, an experimental library, but it allows you to do this kind of stuff, which I think is quite exciting. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much a whistle-stop tour of Gaussian processes. I hope it's kind of given a little bit of insight into what they're useful for and what, kind of, uh, what, 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 what they can be useful for in the future. And uh, yeah, half an hour is not enough time to go into the, into the details. So if you do want the details, come find me afterwards. Um, I always love to chat about these kind of things. Thanks very much. Now, Thanks, um, Mark. That was awesome. awesome. Yeah, brilliant. With some really cool visuals as well. And are there any questions for Mark? Anyone um, using Gaussian process? Oh, we've got, we've got two. All right. Actually, who, are, who, are you, who are you away from? Who are you away from? Amy Finn Yang. 
Yeah. Uh, something about the drawbacks. Ah, yeah, exactly. The drawbacks at the end. Was, uh, so um, I call them research challenges. So the reason why we, so Gaussian processes historically have been very difficult to scale up, and uh, the reason is it's because you need to perform matrix inversions uh, in a single kind of forward and backward pass, right? Whereas in neural networks, you only have to do these very quick and cheap matrix multipliers. So a lot of research work has been uh, to make this matrix inversion as small as possible, and I think soon we might even be able to do away with that altogether. So there are computational reasons why they're currently difficult to, uh, to scale up, but they're kind of disappearing. Uh, another problem is that although this marginal likelihood allows you to automatically find the right uh, model, it penalizes you very, very harshly when you don't have the right model. And so that means that Gaussian process models, when you don't design your model well enough, severely underfit. So what's interesting about neural network models is that you kind of can throw this big goo at something, and even if you use the wrong model for, uh, for a particular problem, like you throw a fully connected neural network at a, uh, an image problem, it'll still fit fairly well, you know, but uh, Gaussian processes will do exactly what you ask of them, and a poor model will often perform very, very poorly. So there's a challenge there of understanding um, how to make better Gaussian process models. But this is helped, obviously, by the fact that we can train things automatically, right? We just need larger scale uh, models that, can, that we can put more ingredients into. I think this, uh, it's a pretty exciting time at the moment. There's a chat behind you in the stripy shirt. I, uh, yeah, I, I'm showing you very well. I had the update there. This was also my tool that I'm cognizant. Um, yeah, I've actually used UPFlow um, a while ago uh, for a lot more question. I found that was, it was quite useful when, um, in terms of specifying like, arbitrary loss functions. Um, my second point was actually the uh, yeah, thing that was raised in the video to the race problems with uh, which is specifying the kernel of the various matrix. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering whether there were you did anything with the, the memory problems um, associated with that in GP5. Sorry, what was the last thing that like, whether we did you, done anything about the problems in specifying the, the covariances? Yeah, the, 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 the inversion and so forth. And the, is it you've got to run out of memory or it just can't progress the whole? Oh, it's about, okay, so whether we're solving yeah, the problem of inverting that matrix. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so like I said, that's, that's a research problem. And um, yeah, a lot of people are working very hard on. Uh, solving that problem. But I do think that we've made tremendous strides in the last few years in making this much less of a problem, and I think that uh, in the next year or so, uh, much bigger improvements can, uh, can be seen. Essentially, I've got a hypothesis that um, essentially I believe that there's no reason why doing a Gaussian process should be any harder than doing a neural network. And what you're kind of seeing, which I think is quite exciting, is that algorithmically and computationally, the training of Gaussian process models is starting to look more and more like normal neural networks, only with added regularization terms that give you all these uh, kind of nice properties. So I think there's a little bit of research that still needs to be done to get exactly there, but um, yeah, we're, we're getting there. Any more for any more? Okay, there marks the end of another TensorFlow session.